Here we are again. Here we are. So, uh, anything on your mind? No, I've been learning about, I say no, and then I say something. <laughs> well, I've been learning about childhood trauma a little. So that's been interesting. Yeah. And, and the you, way it affects us now. And you said you were thinking about, uh, uh, last time you said you were thinking about 12 step. Yeah. And I haven't thought about it since. Okay. Have you done anything more with it? Well, I didn't go this week. I, I went to my second meeting. I didn't go this week. I, I got into, uh, video games again. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Got a little free time this week and a little depressed and I got into the video games, watched a few movies, which I hadn't done in, in weeks. So Did you watch uh, anything good? Yes. I watched Not Without My Daughter. Oh yeah. Apparently what did you think? Yeah, it's an older movie because uh, Sally Field or Fields or Field is is younger in it and I guess she's a year older than me. Hmm. And, uh, oh, really great. It was about a, her husband tricked her into going back to Iran. A lot of the Iranian uh, man, uh, uh, expatriates uh, were really excited when the Shah of Iran was deposed. Mm. And so they, they secretly, they wanted to go back to Iran because, you know, a Muslim state. And yeah. so uh, he didn't tell her. He tricked her, and when they went back, she, she's automatically an Iranian city, citizen, and uh, he got violent, and uh, it was just, it was like the sound of music, you know, ha escaping from, mm -hmm. they went over hills and mountains and, and escaped wow. to Turkey. Wow. So would you recommend it? Oh, definitely. Definitely recommend it. I also watched Dark waters which is the story of an attorney who's also about my age uh bill uh, something billet joe billet i believe or john billet Billot, who sued dupont he spent basically his whole career since around 99 suing dupont <laughs> for 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 teflon the the the, the manufacturing process of Teflon. Because Teflon is dangerous for people or? Yeah, he was a lawyer who represented DuPont. He worked for a big firm that represented chemical companies. And a guy that knew his grandma in West Virginia, I believe, uh, showed up in his office one day, at least according to the movie, and begged him to, to represent him in against DuPont because all his animals were dying and DuPont had created a dump on this man's brother's farm that DuPont had bought from his brother and turned into a dump and it had polluted this man's stream, this man's creek. And, uh, oh, it was just a fast, fantastic story. Oh. There ended oh. up being a big settlement that DuPont ended up reneging on. Uh, and he ended up suing DuPont one person at a time. Uh -huh. He DuPont had agreed to test all the people in this community, and they tested 62,000 people. And the scientific panel that they agreed to have agreed say, ended up saying 4,000 of them had a case against DuPont. Uh -huh. And so when P DuPont pulled out of the deal, he said, okay, here we go. Lawsuit one, they, they won about a million and a half dollars. Lawsuit two, they won about five million dollars. <laughs> Lawsuit three, they won about 12 million. And DuPont uh -oh. says, we'll settle for, you know, 600 million. <laughs> wow. Oh, I man. I guess he's still at it. So that was good. Good dark waters. Dark waters. Huh. Sounds cool. And I've been playing Bloons Tower Defense 6. <laughs> are you feeling bit. any better yeah actually i think i it, depression doesn't bother me too much i mean 
I don't know. It doesn't bother me. I, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. You just kind of play video games for a while and then it goes away. Just take a nap. <laughs> take a nap. Drink your smoothie. I'm lucky. I don't have a lot of real heavy commitments I have to do. You know, I'm old. I started lifespan integration therapy. Um, you have to come up with a timeline of your life with at least one event in every year after one years old. At least? Uh, wow. Yeah. And so that's what I've been working on. Started it last week with my therapist and then I finished it in a couple um, times at home, sat down a couple different times and it was surprisingly uh, traumatic, not traumatic, but it was, um, you know, emotionally difficult to just get the timeline down. So that was, that was interesting. An emotionally significant thing in, in at least every year. It doesn't have to be emotionally significant. It just has to be a real memory. A real memory. A memory of that year. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, but you should include emotionally significant things. Also, if you have a memory from that year that's emotionally significant, you would put that instead of an insignificant relationship. I mean, memory, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, interesting. Next week, I'll really start it where we'll actually start doing the therapy. So far, we've just been getting the timeline ready. So. Well, I'd love to hear about some of that but it sounds yeah. really cool. Yeah, it's fun. I remembered. <laughs> um, so do you remember, you may not, you may have already been out of the house by the time this happened, but because of the going through this timeline, I've been kind of looking at some pictures that I have and uh, the timeline is not supposed to come from photographs. It's supposed to be actual memories, but I was checking the photographs for dates of when things happen. Um, anyway, do you remember we made a swimming pool in the back of dad's truck? I do. I, I vaguely, yes, I remember that. Uh, yeah. So I was looking at the pictures and there were like eight neighborhood girls swimming in the back of our pickup truck. We lined it with plastic and filled it up with water and it was great. We jump off the cab into the... Into the didn't pay any attention to the tires or anything of the truck <laughs> well i think we did it two times and then dad was like this can't be good for my truck no more <laughs> but, oh, you know was, we had a we there was a lot of beautiful things in our childhood <laughs> well he was haws enough i think to have to find out if it would work you know what i mean once i was like hey dad could we line the back of the truck with plastic? He was just hot enough to be like, ooh, we better try it. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of freedom. Yeah, we did. <laughs> well, it's a really fun childhood. There was a lot of really fun things about our childhood. <laughs> yeah. I remember one time I was riding my bike with Russell Webb, and we got up toward uh, Mesa Lutheran Hospital about a, a what, what, a quarter, three-eighths of a mile away. <laughs> yeah. And Lou, Russell Webb saw that hospital there. He said, oh, I can't be this far away from home. <laughs> uh, like, wow. We went too far. <laughs> we went too far from home. <laughs> you had to turn around and go back home. <laughs> yep. It was but fun. Are there other, any other fun ones? That was the biggest one I can that jumps out at me as being fun yeah. the others were more neutral yeah. you know just life well you talked about the purpose of our talk and uh, we, do, we don't we, we the purpose of our talk is to talk okay and when we have other people um, you know it, it would be lovely to me to bring people that I don't understand mm -hmm. you know uh, well, just dive, just like you, diverse people with with their different uh, things. Yeah, um, I'd love to talk to partisans. You know, 
um, in this moment, I, I, wa I, I, don't, I, I want to understand more deeply uh, uh, let's talk, okay, Kamala Harris. She, I liked her the least of all the Democratic, uh, probably the least of all the Democratic candidates in 2020. And I've had, I've worked hard to, you know, feel a little more positively. Um, but I would like to hear, uh, for example, Mom. I would, you know, really ask without, you know, judgment. Try to understand the worst, the, her worst fears about Kamala Harris. Mm. I would like to really understand that more deeply. Talk to an atheist, and. Um, understand more deeply why you know what you know what it what why you know they 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 feel the way they do I mean I know I remember me I know why I couldn't believe why I believed death was final I mean I know uh, but yeah, I'd like to just ask and understand more deeply, because I I don't know about you, but we need to be able to have faith in each other. And I, I see these conversations not going very anywhere very fast, because I want the res right after one sentence to say, wait, I think I I want to understand more about that word. What do you mean? Are we saying the same thing when we say this? Yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, how yeah. about you? Yeah, that, and I, I like that idea of, you know, defining the words because I've been, I've been hanging around this Christian community, um, Episcopalians, they're pretty liberal Christians, especially in my congregation. Um, they're mostly <laughs> former members of the church and, um, but I have some hangups, you know, with what they talk about. I'm like, no, that's not right. And I, that's, that's hurtful. That's harmful. But uh, one thing that's been really helpful is to realize, to think about, are we using words differently? Or, or do words mean something different than what they've come to mean? Or, um, yeah, just one example. Oh, I should tell you. Um, and then I'll remind me that I'm giving an example of words or whatever that I said. <laughs> um, so I have been going to St. Mary's Episcopal Church and they invited a rabbi or they hosted him to come and do a Shabbat dinner one Friday night, last Friday. And I got to go and it was really fun. It's fun to, um, I ended up he had everybody bless each other and he ended up coming over to me and the lady I was with and actually putting his hands on our head and I put my hand on his head. And so I blessed a rabbi last weekend and he blessed me and it was really fun. And he, um, after everyone had done the blessing in English, he kind of sang, chanted in the traditional way, the Hebrew version of the blessing just for me and the lady I was with. And it was, that was amazing because I was like, I mean, I didn't even think of it at the time. I just felt it, but I'm like, those words have been said for thousands of years, every Friday. And at that time, how many Jews were saying those words as the sun went down that, you know, at that same moment and in the original Hebrew, or I mean, I don't know about original, but in Hebrew and- um, That's connection. It was cool. Yeah, it was a very, very cool experience. Um, and then he came and he, for the sermon at St. Mary's that Sunday, he and the priest there, her name is Danny, had a dialogue about, uh, I think it mostly ended up being about law. And um, it was fascinating. But the reason I thought of that was because to go back to what I was saying about the way words mean different things, um, I was noticing so one of the issues that I struggle with with there is the idea of obedience and like that God doesn't demand obedience. I feel like God doesn't demand obedience. And I feel like um, 
God doesn't give us a bunch of rules we have to follow and in order to gain his love in our lives and to have God in our lives. And I'm using the key because that's what I'm used to, but um, the God essence, whatever you could call it. I don't know what to call it. The universe. Home. I just go. <laughs> yeah. Home. Oh, uh, home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Home. Home. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, uh, anyway, yeah, I struggle with, you know, they're pretty, they're, like I said, they're very liberal. I'm almost comfortable with everything they talk about. Their emphasis is very much on the love of God, and, but they still have their traditional um, liturgy, and, and they still follow the Bible. Um, like, that's, the priest mostly studies, she only studies the Christian tradition, which is just, blows my mind. I'm like, if you're interested in spiritual things, why limit yourself to, anyway, sorry, but that's a side, a side thing. Just for Episcopalians. <laughs> um, anyway, I realized though, we were talking about obedience and I was feeling uncomfortable and, you know, I just feel like a lot of people end up with a lot of guilt because of this idea of we need to obey or it, I, I have to earn God's law mm -hmm. by I'm sorry, earn God's love by following his law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just think it leads you away from God's love. It can be, it can end up putting a, a barrier between you and God. And so, so it's, it's very uncomfortable for me when I hear it because I really, really want all these people that I'm becoming really good friends with to have a clear path of love to God. And, um, path to God's love. Anyway, um, we, so they brought, they were talking about God's law and they pulled up, I'm going to pull it up real quick. The Lord. They pulled up. Okay. So it's 119. Do you see somewhere where it talks about the law of the yes. Lord? Verse one, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will do, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Keep going. Well, that's not the part. The whole entire chapter, and it's super long, is about law. But there was one particular set of verses that we read that just kind of made... Okay, this is the point I'm trying to get at. I think, this is my theory, based on this discussion with this Episcopal Church and when the rabbi came and they talked about it, um, my theory is that they're saying every time they say law, they could say love. Well, Swedenborg, Emanuel Swedenborg in uh, Heaven and Hell said, no other government is possible in the heavens other than the government of mutual love. The yeah. government of mutual love is heavenly government. I think I found the verses, but this is a different version, so they looked really different, so it threw me off. But um, So it's not the same in this translation, but your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. The other one, it basically it would say, it would say, your law is a delight to my soul. Your statutes bring me light. Your blah blah give me comfort and rejoicing. And I'm thinking, I'm reading these verses and I'm thinking, this is the exact experience I've had with what I call God, which I could just call it love, is that when I experienced it, 
like they were describing exactly how I feel after and with that experience and surrounding that experience. Like my understanding is opened. I'm rejoicing. I'm filled with light. I'm filled with peace. And they're, they're describing it, but they're saying your statutes are this. Your commandments are this. Your law is this. And I'm thinking, well, they're talking about God's love. Like clearly they're describing their experience when they feel God's love. Yeah. Yeah. And they have felt it. Yeah. So to me, so I, I think there, there's in my, this is my theory in the Bible, there's a confusion about law and love and, and they become separate instead of being when you live in the love love of God and or in love you naturally live this way these are the things you naturally do when you love you honor your parents you keep the Sabbath day holy you find time for stillness because you need to reconnect with that love regularly right and and just stop you naturally don't lie to people you naturally wouldn't bear false witness. You wouldn't kill someone. You wouldn't, you wouldn't commit adultery. You wouldn't, um, like all those things in the, in the 10 commandments. I'm like, what they are is the outflowing of love. They are not. And, but I think it starts to feel like the Bible is saying you need to do these things. So God will love you to show that you love God. And so people start chasing after these commandments without having any of the love involved because they're, and the love is the carrot held out over him. Oh, you'll, you'll get the carrot if you follow these laws. And I think that's a bunch of baloney. If you're just trying to force yourself or not even force yourself, but you're just like putting this law as this important thing that you're following and hoping it's going to lead you to God's love you may or may not, you may or may not find that love that sometimes people find and sometimes people don't find. But I do think you can get really tripped up because you start to, the laws become a burden or they become the point or they become, you get guilty, you start feeling really guilty. And to me, when you feel guilty, you, you basically put up an umbrella so that the love can't reach you. Yeah. And so the law can end up just being an umbrella that you very carefully carry around and cling to. And you never feel that love. And you think it's the point. The point is to hold this umbrella really high, tight. And, and I keep messing up and my umbrella gets bigger and stronger, you know, because I feel so guilty that I'm not perfect at keeping this law. But that the point is not the law. And the law is not the way you get to the love. The love is the way you get to naturally following the law because that's who you are. Like, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And, and the words of the Bible, when I look at, when it uses law and stuff so often, it could be replaced with love. Like and when Jesus teaches the law is love, I think he means it literally like the law in the Bible literally it's just them trying to describe love or love something you know what i mean and love your neighbor yeah yeah i yeah if we can get to understandings and questions and discussions about the words we can maybe get to the more core um understanding the more core differences, the more core differences of perspective. That's what I want. Yes. When I described, I want to get people that don't believe the same as me. That's what I'm talking about. I want to understand where are we seeing the world differently? Yeah. Right. Those core Because differences. when you're talking about that, you're getting, you're getting deep enough that I start to think, about the human aspect of how our childhood childhoods went and did we ever experience unconditional love are we trying to get unconditional love are we are we trying to ever feel accepted 
Are we trying to ever feel okay, worthy? And that, that's, that's a deep uh, problem of human, uh, the human condition is, yeah. do, do are, have we ever experienced unconditional love and are we comfortable that we are loved? Are we filled and surrounded and baptized in love? Yeah. Immersed in love. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. Um, and whether if you, I, well, I, I was just, yeah. I, I'm still very comfortable with a humanist uh, frame of dialogue. I mean, because you got to talk to everybody. Yeah. But uh, anyway. What do you mean by that? Well, as you're talking about this law and love, I think it can also go toward how would a humanist talk about that? How would, you know, how would you talk to an atheist about what would that, how would that sound talking to an atheist? You know, I, I don't know. Anyway, but yeah. getting deep below down into understanding is, yeah, is exciting. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think it can be really tempting to just kind of gloss over things in an effort to avoid conflict in conversation or in relationships or whatever. It'll be like, oh, yeah, when they really don't agree with what, you know, like I said, that maybe, well, I talked to one of our relatives who is a staunch atheist. And the whole time on the conversation, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but afterward, I was like, I don't actually know where we really agreed and where we were just being agreeable. Yeah, and, and you don't have an hour and a half to talk about this one word. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Well, and I, yeah. When I wanted to do that, a podcast like that, I wanted to call it disagreeable. Like the ability to disagree and still feel kindly toward each other. Yeah. So like that we we can disagree and still be agreeable. Right. Yeah, disagree, disagree, yeah. Disagreeable was what I was thinking, but yeah. Anyway. Disagree space oh. able. <laughs> yeah, I I I feel I, I feel excited about that. And uh it's not it's not a slam dunk as to how capable I am of of, of doing that. It's a challenge. Yeah. Well, it's practice. We'd have to practice being disagreeable. <laughs> Just a second. We'd have to practice, yeah, being able to do that, being able to stay really open and loving um, while we talked. Yeah, maybe you and I could... Um... Now, there were some things in our previous talks where I've noticed um, some opportunities possibly where we could uh, push a little harder. Where we might not think exactly the same way about things, but we, we just let it slide because we're having a nice conversation. And, and, and there's not t time to be difficult. Right. There's just not time to be difficult. And I think what we're saying here is we're gifting each other the time and the attention to be difficult. Yeah, and the permission to not agree with me. To inquire more deeply. It's not... Yeah, to understand each other better. It's not that I really... I mean, we may disagree. But... I have faith that probably, look, we, and here's where the humanism goes out the window. 
<laughs> because spiritually speaking, we come from the same source. Mm -hmm. You and I are about the same thing. You chose one life, I chose another. We're messed up in different ways. Humanistically speaking, we are all stardust, but that doesn't go very far. <laughs> I mean, we, well, we again, we, we, we had different upbringings. We have the same interests. We're about the same project. We want humanity to succeed. We want life to succeed. So I think human, humanistically or spiritually, I can believe in agreement. And so I can see all disagreement as transitory. Well, and I think that that's what, what, what our uncle is trying to get to when he um, keeps talking about street epistemology. Like th what he's wanting is the same thing we're saying. Let's talk to people that we don't agree with, but really understand them. And that I'm not sure if I understand street epistemology because it seemed a little more like I wanted to help them understand where they were thinking poorly, which is not what my goal is <laughs> necessarily. Um, and, and it made me a little uncomfortable with it, but it's, it's a similar idea, right? Ways of being able to talk to people that you don't agree with. Um, well, and think about it. Yeah, I thought similarly with, you know, I, I went to the 12 step and I'm there with the LDS church and I'm like experiencing this identical superiority thing like, these people can't teach me anything, you know, <laughs> I've transcended the church, you know, and no, I need to connect. They can teach me things, and I need to get over my superiority and start connecting with people. And whatever wounds I had as a child that made me think I have to be superior so I can be worthy, i, I got to deal with that. Well, the same way, the atheists, they can... I, I, I watched a bunch of those street epistemology videos. Hmm. And with the same thought, I can learn something from this, even though I felt this felt the same thing that you felt. There's something yeah. off here. Well, just because there's something off here, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're right. doing something that I could benefit from. I could learn a thing or two from these guys, even if, yeah, there's something off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I and I do think it's a similar goal that what of what we have, maybe a little different, maybe you know, but there's similarities. Yeah, I think. Well, sh sure. Down your your wounded child wants to you know. You want to save them from their belief in God. You're an atheist. You're out doing street epistemology. You want to save them from the the dangers of religion. You know, the dangers of superstition, to be sympathetic, to st steel man. We haven't talked about steel manning, but that's when you try to make someone's case as strong as you can. They want to save people from the dangers of superstition and, and all that. But I would like to ask them, you know, about you have a belief in, in that death is final. How sure are you about that belief? Would you want to know if it weren't true? And, you know, I do they, I, there have been some where people have done street epistemology on them. I totally, you know, bless and respect and, and give gratitude for, for what they're doing. So, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah. Just because there's something off. And, yeah, so I learned... I, <laughs> Well, and I think that we feel similarly to them sometimes, like, uh, 
me at St. Mary's where I'm like, wait a minute, you're thinking something that's hurting you and your congregation or potentially could hurt you. And I want to save you from these beliefs. That's very similar to what the atheists are thinking about, right? Like, um, and even like bringing up, you know, I think that there might be something to this, that there's more than this, just this life. Let's bring it up and let's explore it. There might be an element of that, like, hey, atheist people, you're you're believing something that's not serving you well. Let's explore it, right? Which um, is similar maybe to what the street epistemology people are doing. I think it's really very natural when we feel like we found something that could help someone to want to uh, help them change the way that they see things and move it to way this helpful way. You know, like I think you and I probably feel similar to the atheist people doing the street epistemology sometimes when we interact with people, but that's not what we're wanting for this. That's not our goal for this um, the, setting, the right? Talk, yes. Yeah, right. The we're just wanting to explore and understand where exactly is it that we really are disagreeing. And, 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 and more outside than that, we want to model and participate in and be a part of something good, positive, healing, loving, and connecting. Yeah, to show that it is, you, you can disagree and you can disagree safely and you can disagree kindly and... <laughs> Yes, yeah. and but we are able to disagree. I watched the uh, vice presidential debate last night. And was it perfect? No, but it was a breath of fresh air for everybody. People can actually talk and not just call each other a <laughs> bunch of names. <laughs> we have all been traumatized in ways we don't know. And last night, eh, it wasn't perfect. But at least they were talk they were talking about things that in another setting they might not have risen to the occasion of talking about. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I should watch. Yeah. Yeah. It does us so good. It does us so good yeah. to see just not rank insanity when you're trying to have a, a discussion. Yeah. Now yeah, the, well, and, yeah. And a little bit of humility, not in the sense of I can't stick by what I think or value what I think, but in the sense that I can also allow you to stick by what you think and value what you think and not assume it's because you're an idiot. Right. Like, trust, you have good reasons for thinking what you think and that you might get good outcomes from thinking what you think, right? Instead of that, you need to think what I think so you can have good outcomes. Um, yeah. Right. Well, my outcomes aren't so hot, right? <laughs> Who's to say? Yeah, I'm I mean, I, maybe I'm You're not. I'm a big, yeah, I'm a big fat know-it-all yeah. and not dis and not connected with people. Sure, my life's not a shambles, but you know, I'm lucky. So right, right. I mean, I I, I ask yeah. myself, would I want? Do I really care? Am I sure that Carl Sagan or Sam Harris would be better off? not believing that death is final. We could talk about it. <laughs> well, and it, for me, it comes down to, can I hold this belief, whatever it is, and still look at a sunset and feel transcendent? Can I hold this belief and still go hiking in the mountains and see the beauty? Can I hold this belief and still enjoy the smell of a flower? Can I hold this belief and still hold a child and enjoy them laughing? Like, at, when it comes right down to it, 
the joy of life. Does it matter what which belief I want, right? right. There are far right Republicans who are thoroughly enjoying their life and see the beauty all around them. There are far left Democrats who are thoroughly enjoying life and seeing the beauty all around them. So what's the problem? We can't talk, doing that's something. the problem. That's the right, problem. and the problem is that there's schisms between us. But, but I guess what I'm saying for these discussions is at the bottom, at the end of the day, we can all go out and watch the sunset together. And all the things we talked about and all the things we disagreed about don't matter. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. So let's not let it divide us. Uh, uh, let's. Yeah, and watching the sunset together is part of the healing and the connection. Of connecting, yeah. It, 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 it's not silly. It's not superstitious. It's really what we need. Uh, Covey, Stephen R. Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People told the story of the, I hate to bring, invoke this, but the Manhattan Project and how the guy that got them together spent a week or two just doing team building exercises and people were like, you're wasting a bunch of time. But he wanted them to really have faith in each other as individuals, that you are a competent, caring person, so they could really work together without doubting each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's, when you see someone enjoying the symphony or you go to a music concert together, Coldplay or whatever, you're all there. It doesn't matter. Like that's when you start to realize I can stay connected with these people and they think this. They don't think that because they're worthless. I know they're not worthless because I saw the joy that they experienced in this moment. And you want with a greater desire you want more deeply and more strongly to agree with them yeah and you feel humble gee i don't agree with them what's wrong with me yeah because they're so cool they're so I need cool to think about this. they are so cool why can't i get it through my thick head to agree with them why don't i understand why they don't like donald trump why don't I understand why they don't like Kamala Harris? Why don't I understand why they don't like God? I need to. I need to understand. Yeah. 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 I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. I, I, I do too. I'm, I'm eager to, to, to get some other people on. And our Uncle Wallace is, he's on board. Okay, let's do it. It's a little targeted. He wants to talk about a book. And I, I want to set some parameters. Does he want us to read it? Well, I don't know if we need to read it. I do have one hope. We are not allowed to say the title of the book until a certain point in our discussion because it's a huge spoiler, in my humble opinion. Terrible terrible, terrible, harmful spoiler uh, until a certain point in our discussion to even mention the title of the book. So I will talk, okay. let's talk ahead of time, maybe before we start the podcast at that time. But yeah, he's probably our first uh, conversant. Okay, that'll be fun. I haven't talked to him in a long time and I've never had a meaningful conversation with him. Yeah. So yeah, this will be nice. Yeah. That's the downside of having 18 aunts and uncles. I know. And <laughs> fingers crossed. I mean, hopefully someday we can get Kelly Black. Our brother That'd be great. And uh, maybe my son, Michael. I don't know if you've got any family members, but uh, hey. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Another factor is honesty. Oh, yeah. We, we both care about telling the truth. And this yeah. touches on our very way of being here in these talks. Uh, and I've, I've picked up 
on this very clear from you, and I agree very deeply about authenticity. Uh, there is a certain amount of showbiz in showbiz, and we we want to be very conscious about that and not be fake, whatever that yeah. means, right? Yeah, and I, yeah, I was thinking that that before we started. Like, it's important to me. Yeah, I combed my hair. I put on a shirt that didn't have a stain on it, but I just got done cleaning my bathroom and I'm sitting in my bedroom as it is with these weird things. Like, this is just life. And this that's is what the, I would I Now we are where I wanted to be and I forgot. I went to the dermatologist this week and I got two cosmetic removals of the red oh. red angioma blood colored uh, raised surfaces one on my shin and one on my belly okay and i had to do therapy on myself exactly like you just did i comb my hair i put on deodorant that's purely cosmetic i really yeah. had to do therapy on myself for being guilty for getting these cosmetic removals yeah. You know, and I still, I'm, yeah. at, I'm at the office, I'm saying it talks to me, I have to touch it while I'm doing my engineering, every once in a while it itches, you know, I'm doing a functional justification, you know, it's not purely cosmetic. Right. The same thing right. with my braces, you know, I never could get braces until I, I found I was biting my lip too often when I ate. I couldn't do it for cosmetics, but I do brush my hair. I comb my hair. I I wear deodorant. I yeah. put on, I, other than a white t-shirt for these tops. I wear a white t-shirt, a white undershirt, every day, all the day. So, and do we include in these talks our testing, testing, one, two, three? You know, there is a balance. There is a balance <laughs> out of kindness. I mean, I think, right, we don't want to waste people's time. And if we waste people's time, why should they come spend time with us, right? Right. And they're, they're right there. That's honesty about, some honesty about that. Um, our primary purpose is to talk. Yeah. And we are doing it in public for the purpose of being public about this. Not for the purpose yeah. of monetizing a channel. This is good that we're saying these things out loud. Not for the purpose yeah. of getting all the views we can. And I think you and I are both okay if there's only six views on a video. Yeah, that feels cool. We got to talk to six people today. <laughs> it may mean, it could mean that we could learn something. Yeah. But, but it may not. And we have to be, we, we be very careful about that. Because six yeah. people, one person matters. And the person, you matter. That's the key. You matter. Mm -hmm. I matter. Wallace matters. And if that's all that happens, under the guise, under the thing that we're out in the front yard with loudspeakers talking, that's good enough. Yeah. We both yeah. feel that? I mean, how do you feel about that? I like, I mean, we... I hope that we don't completely replace our personal conversations on the phone with these, but we, and to a certain degree, these are us just catching up with each other, talking about what we're thinking about. And we would do that anyway, because we like to talk to each other. And this way we're just saying, Hey, do you want to join us? Do you want to come talk with us? So yeah, if nobody watches, that's fine. We still got to have our nice talk like we enjoy doing. Yeah. So it's not a waste. Yes. It's not I, a loss. I love getting to yes. And you can't get to yes until you're honest because you can't get to yes until you get to that scary place where maybe it's not yes. And right. 
That's the beauty, and that's the honesty, and that's that, this segment, you know, we, where we're going into this honesty, authenticity, and chaos. You can't get to yes until you go through the chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, the in the discussion that the priest and the Episcopal priest and the uh, Jewish rabbi had last on Sunday, she talks about the importance of the wrestle and how important it is, especially when dealing with the Bible, to not put on a pretty bow, not say, well, this is messy and ugly and I don't understand it and it makes me feel uncomfortable. Oh, here's the explanation. And I put a pretty bow on it. Now I don't have to think about it anymore. And I move on. That's like, to the next. that's like, oh, it's a tree. I don't have to look at it anymore. Tree. Right. Dog. Or even, well, even like, I think she's talking about things like, well, this is dog poop on the ground. I don't like to have dog poop in my Bible because it's weird. Why would we say this is important for me to study when I don't like it? It's uncomfortable and it's kind of gross. There's stuff like that in the Bible, right? And it's tempting to say, oh, we, we, it's just there to fertilize for the rest of the stuff, right? And I don't have to actually look at it or smell it or think about it. I'm just going to put a pretty bow on it and say, oh, it's fertilizer. And I'm going to go look at the trees and the flowers. And she's like, no, you need to stop and look at the ugly stuff in the Bible. You need to wrestle. And that was the big word. It's like, don't put a pretty bow on it and walk away. Wrestle with it wrestle 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 don't because there's a story about the syrophoenician woman i think i may have brought it i i don't remember if i brought it up last time but um she jesus like calls a woman a dog um oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah we shouldn't give the the people's food to the dogs yeah yeah and and the whole exchange is uncomfortable it, it goes against our little picture that we have of Jesus. It goes against our picture we have of Christianity. So she gave a sermon on that. But then later, actually at the Shabbat dinner, we were sitting by someone who is actually a member of the church. Um, and I brought it up. I brought up this, that story and Danny's sermon about it because I thought the lady might enjoy it because she was very much... Um, I don't know. It seemed she was a very liberal member of the church and very into uh, feminism and things. And I, th I thought she would enjoy the sermon. Um, it was a masterful sermon. But she what she said is, oh, she wouldn't even like listen to me long enough for me to say, you should listen to this sermon. She was said, um, oh, I did a podcast about that. And um, she, he wasn't calling her a dog. It's actually, the word was puppy. The word is puppy, and that's what it was, and then moved on. So she took a little, put a pretty bow on it. Dunk. He wasn't saying she's a dog. She was saying, he was saying puppy. Now we don't have to think about this story anymore. And I wonder if that was part of why the priest brought this up the next Sunday, which was two days later, where she was like, no, we don't want to just put a pretty bow on it. We want to wrestle with the story of the Syrophoenician woman. We want to figure out why did the translators leave it in there? If they wanted us to just put a bow on it and ignore it, they would have just left it out. Or if they just thought, oh, this is no good, they would have just left it out because it comes across as no good. It's like, but um, we need to wrestle with it. And I really, I like that I think we often, when we are saying, well, I believe this because of this, we're putting lots of pretty bows on things. We're ignoring all the things that the other side is seeing clearly. And that's why they believe about the other side. And, and if we're going to talk to people who don't believe the same as us, we both have to be willing to say, yeah, it's not as simple as I'm making it seem. I'm slapping some pretty bows on this subject in order to really stick close with what I believe about it. But am I willing to take those bows off and really we both just sit and look at it 
the two of us together. And so I hope when we have, as we do our discussions that you or maybe I, that we will remember to be like, okay, are we all being really honest here? And call each other and our guests out and hopefully our guests will call us out. You know, are we really looking at this honestly? That takes time. That's the problem. It's expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. And it is very expensive. I'm, you know, I'm trying to get better lighting here. <laughs> so I figured, <laughs> yes, we're being authentic, you know, move my computer. It caused a little bit of technical glitch, but that's expensive. Very expensive. But we have, we can afford it. Like, okay, so we get Wallace on here. We talk about something and we can't, we get stuck on this one thing that we're like, we got to be honest about this and we're not. Let's get down to the honesty. And that takes us the whole time to be able to see this one thing honestly, where we're all being willing to really honestly look at it. Maybe we can say, okay, that was wonderful. Can you come again in two weeks? We'll pick up where we left off. Right. Right. And that's where we're like, it's expensive not to agree. It's expensive not to explore. Right. And we're not trying to cover a lot of territory. Yeah. Yeah. We, it's okay. And if it ended up where we, we got stuck there and we're wrestling and then Wallace is like, no, I don't want to come back. That was uncomfortable and I didn't enjoy it. That's okay. Because for me, at least, what I want to learn to do is recognize when I'm not being honest about something or when someone I'm talking to isn't being honest about something or when that's the cause of us having issues with it is that we're not being honest about like So just having recognized it and started exploring it is super useful yeah. for this whole thing. If we, we commit to each other you know, as we believe in each other, to to help each other, uh, be honest, to want yeah. to, to to want to be helped by each other, to be honest. Right. And it's faithful dialogue. I, I believe in you. You want to be honest. You want yeah. you you want to uncover your self deceptions, even though that's painful. And we can't know all the truth, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But that means we have to be really open and honest with um, the people that we invite on, that they know yes. that's what the goal is. Are, are you comfortable with that? Are you okay with that? Are you willing to come on and be fully honest? Like we're all gonna really, really help each other be honest about this. Maybe we can write a little, uh disclosure yeah that's okay. a good idea okay yeah i i'm glad we went there because um the honesty is is elusive and being honest about i don't really get that and i i or or even the plain old daily mundane honesty that wasn't there in the debates I have to say last night, I was blown away by something you never hear. One of the, one of the debaters, one of the vice presidential candidates, at the end of the debate, he said, you know, we've both, um, basically, we've both pulled some whoppers tonight. Stretched the truth a little here he and there. He did. He said that. He said, we what? have both. Yeah, we both have uh, kind of misspoken or, or said some things that weren't true tonight. I, the, I, this is a this is a lifelong sore spot for me. I remember as a little boy, why aren't they calling each other on these whoppers? And it's hard in the moment. It's hard in the moment. And that's what you and I are saying. It's hard in the moment, and we want to take the time and value, and really that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, that yeah. was a great talk. Yeah, thank I, you. I am glad we went there. And so let's, yeah, let's give each other a call, maybe do some emailing and come up with with uh, some kind disclosures of, of how crazy you and I are. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> make sure people know what they're getting into. <laughs> no, make sure they know what they're getting into. Uh, I always love talking to you. Me too. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.